<laughs> well, thank you very much, Hilary. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, it's always nice to be here. I love Sterling. I came into the train and, and, and walked up. Uh, so uh, I thought if I talk to you a lot of bron bronchiolitis at the end of the day, you'll all be brain dead before I start. So I've broadened my remit a bit to talk about uh, chest infections. So uh, what I'm going to do... Um, well, that's not working, did you say? Oh, this was a dummy, right? Okay, fell for that one. <laughs> right, so uh, yeah, uh, this has to be the time of year when uh, coughs and colds spread diseases. So this, I, I thought it was very timely. Um, I think what I'm going to talk about is the acute respiratory presentation in the child with a focus in two parts. First of all, the assessment, diagnosis and management. But before I go any further, has anybody in the last month assessed the child with an acute respiratory infection? Just so that I know couple. How many of you have got an, a child with an acute respiratory problem or grandchild at home? Right, right, okay. So this is going to be useful to about half of you. I'll hope to be entertaining and educational for the, for the other half. So I'm a very fond believer of saying what I'm going to say, say it, and then say that I've said it. So this is what I'm going to talk about, okay? I know that I've got you for a short period of time before you start thinking about your exit strategy. <laughs> so when you're assessing children, and I used to do adult medicine as well, and it was pretty much the same then, in terms of the assessment and the diagnosis, it's all about the history, with a little bit about the respiratory rate, with a little bit of saturations. As I get less young, as my hair approaches the colour of my jumper, I use the stethoscope less and less because all it does is it just introduces a bit of uncertainty into my previously clear assessment. So I put less and less weight on the stethoscope these days. Um, and the other thing is that, and I tell medical students this and I try to encourage my consultant colleagues, children and adults, with chest infections die because of hypoxia and shock. They do not gain any benefit from steroids or antibiotics for hours, okay? So we do think, oh, cracky, child with chest infection, antibiotics or not. You don't need to worry about that. The important thing is the oxygenation and the hydration. And in some cases, with chronic respiratory things, the, 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 uh, the, the nutrition. So oxygenation, hydration, and then worry about the treatment and be rest assured that the treatment you're going to give is probably going to do more harm than good if you give anything. So these are some of the things I'm going to talk about in the next half hour. Uh, I'm not going to talk about asthma, but I'm happy to do so if so challenged. So, respiratory assessment of a child is what we all do inherently when we're just sat taking a history. So by the time mum has finished talking about the fact that the child's been coughing and spluttering and the whole of the family are full of cold, you've already worked out whether this child's respiratory rate, respiratory effort is, 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 uh, is normal or not. There's this lovely expression of sukin. We all talk about shortness of breath at rest and, and, and I find that very hard. In kids, this mum, parents will often talk about tummy sticking in, ribs, ribs sticking in, tummy sticking out, breathing with the abdominal muscles. Um, which of course you don't, but, but these are, if a child is breathing with its tummy muscles, its ribs are soaking in, it's working pretty hard. I would have to remove 70% of your lungs, it'd be a bit messy, so I'll not. But believe you me, you have to be down to about 30% of your lung function before you're short of breath at rest. So if that is happening, you've got a problem with the breathing. And then the oxygenation, well, we have all of these oxygen probes, about 10, 15% of our patients have these oxygen probes. The way that the oxygen probes works is that it, the, 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 the saturations are rarely falsely high, but can be. Very low saturations in a child who's looking pink are inevitably to be ignored. Uh, the, the, the magic number at the moment is somewhere between 90 and 94%. Okay? But the thing that I, again, try to emphasize is that the oxygenation is only really important as things are in, uh, getting worse, okay? Once they're getting better, the oxygenation is, is irrelevant. And the reason for that is that the pulse oximeter on the finger or the ear or in the bed is rubbish. You all have a pulse oximeter in your brainstem. That's the one that keeps you breathing. You know you don't need to remember all of the time, okay? So as the children are getting better from their respiratory infection, if things are getting better, I, don't, I just don't, don't measure the saturations because I know that their own brain stem will drive their respiratory rate. And if their respiratory rate's getting down and their work of breathing's getting down, 
I'm not worried about their, their, their oxygenation. Hydration is all about capillary refill and nutrition generally isn't relevant, but it does become relevant in children with a pneumonia that gets complicated with, it, with an empyema. So it's all about the respiratory distress, oxygenation and, and hydration. So since I was asked to talk about bronchiolitis, I thought I might talk about it. So again, as I get less young, things get much clearer. Um, uh, oh, and if only I could speak to myself 25 years ago. But the key things I look for when I'm diagnosed bronchiolitis in a child, in an infant, are first of all, lots of snot. There's got to be snot pouring out the child. They've got to have ribs soaking in, tummy muscles. And the key thing, the cardinal thing, is there's usually a two or three year old sibling who has no sense of social space but has full nose of virus. Um, a bronchiolitis is a condition of infants and it's a one-off thing. People start getting confused about is it bronchiolitis, is it viral induced wheeze, you know the child doesn't care if it's the first episode it's bronchiolitis. Um, the, the fever is very uncommon Fever is very uncommon in children with, with bronchiolitis, even if mum's got one of those infernal thermometers from the baby box. Oh, if only I could go out and burn them. <laughs> the temperature would still be 38.5. Um, I'll talk about the typical history, but I thought I'd just put this bit in here and there. Hillary's not wrong. RSV hasn't quite arrived yet. You do know it's five weeks on Wednesday, isn't it? Um, and you can see on the horizontal axis here, we've got weeks of the year. This is the first week of the year. Vertical axis is RSV cases and the infants. We have this huge spike the week before Christmas. Um, uh, but but so, so, so basically, um, it does come the week before Christmas. And I don't, do you want, do you, it's a virus, so it has to live in humans. Where does it spend the rest of the year? Whereas it's summer out, it spends its summer in old folks' homes. Um, as you'll see in a second. So I'll talk about the typical history in a second, but... RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, said he putting his teeth in, is something that you'll all be familiar with. Oh, it causes bronchiolitis, chestiness in, in children. But actually, knowing that you're talking, you've been here talking about COPD, it's much more relevant to COPD. So this is a, f uh, on the horizontal axis here, we've got Januaries in different years. Okay, and on the vertical axis, we've got the mortality from RSV in each year. And the blue bits are people aged over 75 and the red bits are infants. And I've rather clumsily blown it up over here. And the purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that the harm to us as a community from RSV is much greater in the elderly, in the grandparents and great grandparents that have this lot here. So RSV is something that causes a burden of morbidity and mortality across all ages, but it does cause, cause bronchiolitis. But one of the things that makes working in healthcare difficult is uncertainty. And we all risk manage it because we can't predict the future. But we can with this. Well, there are two certainties in medicine. First, it's as quiet as anything on Christmas Day because everything goes away. And the second thing is that bronchiolitis, you can predict what's going to happen as sure as night following day. So let's just imagine on the horizontal axis, we've got time. And on the vertical axis, we've got illness. On day one, little Johnny, who typically is the second or third born child, he was born in August or afterwards, and he has a very, very affectionate two-year-old sibling, okay? He gets a bit of a cough because he's been inoculated with a virus, and for a couple of days, he's just coughing, but he's otherwise fine. And then, for three days, as the lower respiratory tract infection bites, mum noticed that, first of all, instead of feeding every, you know, four to five hours, this child is now feeding much more like a newborn baby. So he's feeding frequently, but not for very long. And by day three of the getting worse, that's day five, six into the illness, he's not smiling. He's basically gone back to being day one, okay? He's working hard to breathe, he's not feeding, he's not smiling. And having seen this deterioration for three days, at that point, his mum not unreasonably goes and seeks medical attention. What we know is that they invariably present at the worst. And there's a lot of understanding behind that, because if you've been watching your child getting worse, you do eventually come and seek help. But this is a period where there's nothing getting worse, nothing uh, getting better, and then we have a two-week recovery. So we have this period of snot, 
cough and miserableness, and these three days of poor feeding, followed by two days of, of, of not getting better or worse. And, and the reason why this is so important is that if you see a child here, and their oxygenation's okay, the, 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 the nutrition and the hydration are okay, you know that tomorrow they're not going to be any better or worse. So you can send them home and say, you've done all the hard work. This is exactly what we would have expected. Ride it out. If, however, you're here, the two days or one day into the cough, and their oxygenation is 94%, or they're a little bit cool peripherally, you know that things are going to get worse, and so you don't give a worsening statement, you, you send them in. And this is a really useful paradigm to have. And this isn't just me talking, this is a cracking paper. It, it's slightly sad, but I have my favorite papers. And this is one of them. This is a group of researchers who said, we need to understand what normal is. And what they did was they took data from clinical trials of antibiotics in a whole series of respiratory things in children, and they took the control arm details so they could describe the natural history of symptoms, which is great because we all work, or I work as I get less young, in pattern recognition. Is this what I would have expected? So here they have a duration of symptoms of, of, of bronchiolitis. Okay, so on the horizontal axis, we've got... Uh, time and on the vertical axis we've got proportion with the symptoms and and as you all know we don't all get better at the same time so they've got confidence intervals around this and for bronchiolitis what they've demonstrated is that about 13 days 50 percent of infants with bronchiolitis statistically will have a complete resolution of symptoms after 13 days 20 percent might be better in a week and goodness only knows what happens to this lot here. It's sort of, you know, back end of February, okay? So, so the, the, the thing I like about all of this work, and I'll show you another piece of uh, paper from it, is, is that first of all, it describes the natural history, but it also describes the variability. And you will not be forgiven for realizing that this mob round here are the ones that come and see you, because the quick responders don't trouble you. I need to get out of the habit of pressing that button. So, and this is a long list of all of the medications proven to work in bronchiolitis. <laughs> okay. Um, the, there is no medication that works in bronchiolitis and a whole long list of stuff that makes it worse. These are medicines which are proven not to work. This is really interesting in that the, what, there is still a Cochrane review published that demonstrates that neb nebulized saline helps. And this was published based on three or four small studies in hindsight, they were published because they found that it was beneficial. There were a whole series of small studies that found no benefit that weren't published. When the bigger studies were published and also found no difference, this all had to change. So in terms of evidence, we're working uh, uh, on a moving scale, but there's no medicine proven to help in bronchiolitis. So if there's no medicines that work, what do we do? Well, most of the time, do nothing because the child is robust and healthy, and if it's day three or more, and the saturation is 94%, and the hydration is okay, reassure them, send them home. And the reason why I've put tongue there is that the information I give parents about hydration, it's nothing to do about nappies, because as they drink less, their nappies will get lighter. I don't care about weight of nappies, it's the child. You know a dog, when it's healthy, it's got a wet nose. A child or a human, to be fair, when it's well hydrated, it's got a shiny tongue. That's a very good way, particularly in, 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 in mums who are looking after infants. They often see the tongue. So if the tongue's shiny, don't worry. Um, so, uh, so that's it. So, so now I'm going to slightly digress into, in, in, into lower respiratory tract infection. So when I'm talking about lower respiratory tract infection, I'm talking about the child or the adult with a 48-hour history of fever, proper fever with a proper thermometer, increasing cough, increasing shortness of breath and grunting. Now, I've put this in here to remind me to say the most important person with a chest infection don't care whether it's a virus or a bacteria. The other thing to remind you is that the bacteria, so pneumococcus, haemophilus, mycoplasma, we carry all of these bugs. Also, I've got mycoplasma in my chest. I've got pneumococcus in my chest. We all have bacteria in our chest. So if you're trying to be purist about this and say, 
Is that chest infection bacteria? You can bet your bottom dollar that there is pneumococcus and haemophilus involved in every chest infection that ever existed. Just as there's pneumococcus and haemophilus in the chest of every patient with a urinary tract infection. But it's a completely academic exercise trying to work out whether it's viral or bacterial. If there's a 48 hour history of fever, increasing cough and shortness of breath, they need antibiotics. I was taught that the lungs were sterile. I was taught that this nice warm dark place that's 15 centimeters away from the filthiest orifice in my body is sterile. And I was gullible and I just believed it, okay? We're now enlightened and realized that there's a huge community of bacteria in our airways and they live there quite ha happily. What happens to disturb that commensal relationship is rhinovirus. A rhinovirus comes along, disrupts the epithelium, which is keeping the bacteria over there and the host over there. And that's where the problem comes, which is why people come to you saying, I was back a few days ago and you told me I just got a cold and now I've got a chest infection. Well, that's how it goes. So um, we carry bacteria all of the time, but we don't carry virus all of the time. Um, the word pneumonia, if you want to create hysteria amongst parents, use the word pneumonia. <laughs> if you want to get granny there by speed dial, you can use the two words double pneumonia. <laughs> I think it's a word I, I, I avoid using. Uh, if you tell a parent their child's got a chest infection, they can cope with that. Tell them it's a pneumonia, they get very worried. Um, if you insist you can call it a pneumonia if the signs are focal, they've got crackles and got a high fever, but it's a low respiratory tract infection and it gets the same treatment. Um, so in terms of treatment, things have moved on hugely over the last decade. Um, the, the key things that have happened is that certainly in hospitals, we're very, very happy not to do x-rays. We're very happy not to do blood tests. We're very happy to use oral antibiotics. And we're also very happy not to follow them up with repeat x-rays. I remember as a, when I was a junior doctor, we'd have clinics full of children who'd had a pneumonia and they were brought back to clinic to see if it had resolved. And it had. Uh, and there's good trial-based evidence that IV antibiotics, the only thing IV antibiotics do over all antibiotics is prolong a hospital admission. The child don't thank you for putting the drip in. The parents don't thank you for keeping them in hospital. And the NHS doesn't thank you for the extra cost. So oral antibiotics are very much the way forward. And this is, I put this in because this is quite nice. This is basically just summarizing how things have changed. This is a huge change from where we were in, the, in, in 2000. So this is the National Improvement Objective. Less than 5% having blood tests, less than 10% having a chest X-ray, less than 10% having IV antibiotics, less than 5% coming back for follow-up. I would argue that all of those should be close to 0%, but this is a huge change from what happened. So we are moving hugely. I'm now gonna talk about bronchitis. Um, this is dead common. Anybody who's ever owned a two or three year old and or taken them to soft play recognizes this and you'll see all of this, okay? It's something, it's one of these primary care things that's so common you know it's there but nobody ever describes it and it's only recently started to be described. It's one of these textbook free areas. So what I'm describing is the preschool child with the cough and the rattle. <laughs> Okay, um, it starts week 35. Week 35 is the last weekend of August. That's when the cough and cold season because it's two weeks after the schools go back. In England, it's week 37. Did you all know about this? If you want to put, right, if you want to win the lottery, okay, go get or whatever, put some money on uh, all of the asthma admissions coming in in week 35 in Scotland, week 37 in England. The asthma admissions, the peak asthma admissions in this country are not in the winter. They're week 35 and in England it's week 37. So that's when it all starts. Uh, the kid goes around <laughs> wheezing. Um, when, they, when, they, when they get a cold, things get worse. They cough, cough, cough. And bring it up. Um, when they come to see your good cells, the chest is free of any added sounds. The child is perfectly blissfully unaware they're going around sounding like Darth Vader. Um, and typically what happens is that the child is excessively well and the parent is excessively worried because mother-in-law has said. <sighs> <laughs> and, and you can understand what happens because there is a cycle. So the first fact to remember is that any self-respecting preschool child can get between five and 10 colds a year. 
those five or ten colds are all during the winter months. So what happens is week 35 is the child gets a cold and gets a bit of a wet rattly cough. The cough persists for a couple of weeks because they're those people who just take longer to get better. The cough almost completely goes or completely goes and then you begin with a cold. And it happens, almost completely goes, get another cold. And mum's come to say, you know, it's March now and he's had a cold since August. And you say, well, he's had six colds in those six months and it takes him three weeks to get over each cold. So, yeah, but look at him. You know, if he'd take his fingers out of the plug, he'd be perfectly happy. <laughs> and the characteristic thing is... It's um, and, and the child is very well. And, and what happens is that over time, people do worry just because they think they should worry because it's not getting better. So the red flags, what I should put up here is the cardinal thing here. The thing that should make you worry is that there is no remission. So... Typically, these children, when mum says that, oh, he's been coughing for months. Has he had a few days bef be when he has, well, he sort of, yeah, it does, have, well, yeah, okay, it does go. But then he comes back, okay? That's very reassuring. That's very normal. If it's present all of the time, every single day, that's not right. There are ages... Um, if the child stopped putting weight on or if it considerably affects them. When, when the child gets a cough and, it, and the cycle starts again, they are up for a couple of nights coughing and vomiting. So I do accept that. Personally, for every child that coughs and vomits and has a disrupted night's sleep, there's probably 10 of the similar age who are up anyway without coughing. So I don't regard disrupted sleep in a preschool child as being quality of life for them. They can catch it later on. I've got four kids. I appreciate as a parent, there's a different perspective on that. But the most important person in this is the child. They shouldn't have the soaking in of the ribs. They shouldn't come into hospital. They shouldn't need to come into hospital for this. And if they've got other morbidities, so children with cerebral palsy, children who've got gastroesophageal reflux, just, just think, well, perhaps it's not quite simple bronchitis. So what happens, it's all about the, uh, the, the, the respiratory mucosa. We have these, um, they, they, it's a travelator. It sits on our airways and it moves stuff up. Okay, when that switches off, we have to cough more. Uh, and the respiratory virus switches off the travelator. Uh, and it takes some people five days to recover, it takes some people 20 days to recover. And if your patient happens to be one of those that takes 20 days to recover, and they're getting cold every 21 days, you can imagine they're going to come to you. The reason why they do it is they can poo in their pants at this age. They can have a temper tantrum right here and now, okay? They don't have to speak properly. So they can go around, <laughs> okay? Um, it's, it's a lack of social inhibition that makes them make the funny noise. They don't have an immune deficiency. There is infection there, but it's a secondary infection. Basically, you're just giving fertilizer to their own endogenous bacteria. And if you happen to get, get some sputum off these sort of three or four year old children, you'll often grow him off as pneumococcus there. But, but giving them antibiotics ain't gonna solve the problem. You've got one in three chance of giving them diarrhea. So here we go, here's another slide from my favorite paper. Okay, so on the horizontal axis here, we've got days, vertical axis is duration of cough after a cold. And again, you can see that there are, there's a huge variation. 50% of children will have a cough for 10 days. But this are the mob that are going to come and see you. And it's 10 to 15% of children of preschool age, according to this study here, can have a cough quite normally, which lasts for more than two weeks. This is quite normal. So it's not just my bias. Uh, and this is what I find is that the first, in terms of severity, the first winter is the winter of greatest discontent. Uh, the second winter, they've usually had another child, so they're not too worried about this one here. It's the first thing. The other thing is this is, this is, a, this is a condition of firstborn children of, of university educated parents. Um, and by the third winter, they've given up. Uh, and actually, they've, they've, their level of symptoms is the same as it is for... Um, for, 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 for any, any other child. So the dilemma that people often paint themselves into is should I give antibiotics or not? And again, I see things more and more clearly as I get less young. You could argue that by not treating them, there might be some of them who do benefit from antibiotics. And inevitably within the population, there are some who do benefit from antibiotics. 
But by giving them antibiotics, your risk, about one in, one in, one in three, one in four people given antibiotics will get diarrhea. Uh, and this is from the clinical trials. So, you, so you, your chance of doing harm is much greater than that of good. And actually the quality of life for the child, and I appreciate that sometimes in primary care, it's the parent who's there, it's the parent or the grandparent who's driving them. But the most important thing in this is the child. Quality of life for the child is fine. Sure, they might wake up a little bit, but that's life. They do at that age. So um, I tend not to, the only thing that's ever been proven to help acute cough uh, in kids is, is honey. So the old wives tale is, is right, perhaps not mixed with whiskey, um, <laughs> but, 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 but that's, that, that's, that's the only evidence basis you can give. It's all about doing no harm. So the one, two, three about persistent bacterial bronchitis, first we'll make the diagnosis, and it's this wet, rattly cough that goes on and on and on and on, but is characterized by relapse and remission. Reassure mum or dad or granny, and do try not to treat the antibiotics because your risk of harm is much greater than your risk of benefit. So I've just mentioned croup just to bring it in. So, so croup again is something that uh, you, you'll all have heard of. It's characterized by runny nose and laryngotracheobronchitis. Um, the child comes in with strider, <coughs> which is invariably described as wheeze. Uh, they've usually got a little bit of sucking in of this bit here and they have the, the bit of horse cries. <coughs> And the natural history of croup is that the child wakes up usually at the most hideous hours of all, of all about half, ten, eleven o'clock, just as parents are going to go to bed. And they wake up in a state of confusion, anxiety, and, they, and, and ambulances are called, and it's, oh my goodness, and they're rushing to hospital, by which time they're still a bit noisy, but they're an awful lot better. And then they hang around for six, eight, twelve hours, having been given some steroids. So by the time I come and do my wardrobe at 8 o'clock in the morning, kids bouncing around like that, <laughs> parents looking like that. So, so we send them home. But the thing that we, we tell them home is that, that tomorrow night, at that hideous hour, you get a little aftershock. Imagine an earthquake aftershock, so it will come back a little bit. Don't ask me why. Why does it go away in the day? I don't know. It's not a vampire, but it comes back at night. And again, if you look at my favorite study, it says that the typical duration of croup in children is about two days. There are some children who get three, and there are some who just get one. But it's a very common condition. Treatment is all dexamethasone, uh, and generally, you know, in the old days, you know, we used to have croup tents. We used to tell people to steam things. Honestly, what a load of rubbish. All we were doing is we were just terrifying children for just a little bit longer. <laughs> so um, I, I, I finished. So what, so what I've done is I, I have hopefully kept task and talked a little bit about bronchiolitis. But I thought, as I say, I'd drive you all mad just by talking about one condition. So I've talked a little bit about low respiratory tract infection, about bronchitis, um, and also uh, about croup. And uh, just to go back to what I started off by saying, these are the things I've talked about. So for, for, for children, it's all about history, respiratory rate and effort with SATs. I don't use the stethoscope these days, I really don't. And the management, the key management decisions are about oxygenation and hydration. And if the oxygenation and hydration are okay, do you know what? You probably don't need to worry anymore. If they've got a fever and they've got a bit of sucking in of ribs, then give them some amoxicillin. But generally, no treatment is the way to go. Uh, and on that point, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Steve. I thought that would be a really good uh, end for your day. Any questions or home truths and obvious things that you'd like here. Obviously some wonderful sound bites there for us, Steve. So, anybody want to ask anything? What's yes. the name of your favorite study? Oh, uh, the first author, I think is Robertson. I th that's a very good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, I've put the citation at the bottom. I, I oh, I see, I think of the slides in the pack. Well, they're not actually in the pack. What there you go, so it's BMJ, 2013, 347, bless you. And then it's F. F, 7027. But basically what they've done is they've got duration of runny nose, sore throat, earache, 
really useful for those worried well parents who are sat there thinking, but it's been going on for ages. Well, you know, in some children it only lasts a couple of days, but you know, earache can go on for four or five days quite normally. If you want me to make your child ill, I'll give you some antibiotics, but if you just want to let things go, you know, if your child's got ear pain, I would give them some analgesia, not antibiotics. The analgesic properties of antibiotics are yet to be described. Have you, did you not know the, the other thing is the, 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 the analgesic properties of x-rays. I was at a hockey match when my daughter plays hockey. So one of the kids goes down, breaks the shoulder, and I always sort of hide. And someone said, where's Steve? So I, I ambled up and I said, yeah. And unfortunately by then, a, a first aider got there and had them in the sling. I said, quick, you need to come straight off to cash. And I said, uh, really? Really? Oh, you still need an x-ray. Okay. Is it? Do you not think they just need a bit of paracetamol? I mean, I didn't actually, because I thought I'm not sure. But, but you know, this belief that x-rays, you know, in casualty, they've got analgesic properties yet to be described.